Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. As this video is posted, it is Independence Day weekend. So happy 4th of July, Americans, even if I posted this a day late. <laughs> you're still celebrating, right? We have Friday off, most of us, because it makes it a four-day weekend. So usually on this occasion, I like to do a topical show. I like to do something patriotic, like talk about the flag or talk about you know novels related to the American Revolution, that sort of thing. So this time, I reached a little further down, and I'm going to talk about the Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem. It's kind of difficult to find books about this. I mean, I did my usual online encyclopedia research, Wikipedia, Britannica, etc. But I found a book by a guy named Mark Ferris. Uh, he's got a history degree, but he's only written a couple of books. And this is called The Star Spangled Banner, The Unlikely Story of America's National Anthem, uh, published by John Hopkins University Press 2014, which is the 200th anniversary of the writing of the Star Spangled Banner. And he has a lot of interesting facts about the song and actual controversy behind this song. So as everybody should know, at least as everybody knew in my day when we were in school, the Star Spangled Banner was based on a poem written by Francis Scott Key, and he was a lawyer from Baltimore. And this was written during the War of 1812 when the British were attacking and sacking Washington, D.C., and Baltimore was nearby, so they thought, yeah, why not? We'll, we'll do Baltimore, too. <laughs> so anyway, and it was kind of an offshoot of the Napoleonic War. So they kind of involved us tangentially. Anyway, as the school children are supposed to know, this poem was called The, the uh, Defense of Fort McHenry. However, one of the things Ferris says, one of the myths that he's busting with this book, is that that's not what he named it. He didn't name it. <laughs> the publisher named it. And so, interesting tidbit there. Now, how it came about was that Key was, he was a wealthy man, and he was kind of hanging around when a lot of people had fled the city, and the British arrested him because he was a notable citizen, and they imprisoned him on a ship in the harbor while they were bombarding the nearby fort, Fort McHenry. And he was upset because he thought they were going to destroy this fort and kill a lot of Americans. And lo and behold, in the morning, the flag was still flying. And... He was very, very happy, and he wrote this poem. And this was in September of 1814. And the flag at the time had 15 stars and 15 stripes. And to this day, that flag is known as the Star Spangled Banner. Now, the melody came along, well, actually almost immediately, because as it turns out, he was actually thinking about that melody when he wrote the poem. It was a very popular melody at the time. It was a drinking song, an English drinking song, called To Anacreon in Heaven. The author was John Stafford Smith around 1773 or so. So even though Brits were the enemy, people loved this song. It was kind of a fun song to sing. And the whole idea of the song was for this particular club, the Anacreon Society, and they celebrated this Greek poet, this ancient Greek poet, and so he liked to drink and party, and he liked, he liked the ladies, and he liked to sing. And so they figured he was a great patron, <laughs> a great patron saint, so to speak. So the first words of the actual song start, To an Akron in heaven, where he sat in full glee, A few sons of harmony sent a pit to shun. That he their inspirer and patron would be. When his answer arrived from the jolly old Grecian. And it goes on and on. <laughs> it's fun because it's about, it was basically about all the different Greek gods. And about, uh, you know, how they're going to celebrate and so on, this this guy. And so they like to sing. They, they actually had um, uh, communal sings at every meeting. 
And this song was the first they would sing before their sing-along. And so they were like the first karaoke people. <laughs> and so that's one of the reasons I think the song is difficult, because they like the challenge. So as I said, the song was popular, and people had written a lot of alternate words to it already at, at, at this point in time. But the ones from Francis Scott Key, those were ones that stuck. <laughs> and yet it was not the official na national anthem until 1931 when Herbert Hoover, Herbert Hoover, yeah, Herbert Hoover uh, signed the bill. And people say cynically that Hoover basically spearheaded it because he had to distract from the Depression and because it didn't cost him anything, which is which is a good thing, I think. <laughs> so there's a lot of little known facts that Ferris brings out. And the first is that uh, there was an another national anthem and nobody's really sure which one was the official one and other countries you know other ambassadorial staff or whatnot when they were supposed to play the american national anthem they had to ask what's your anthem <laughs> the other one was called hail columbia which was composed by philip file in 1789 for the first inauguration of george washington it was entitled the president's march and it became hail columbia when joseph hopkinson wrote the word in 1798 and it was very popular for quite some time and in, indeed it was kind of more of a national anthem than the banner was because it was older and so on but if you've ever heard it you don't remember it it's not a very notable melody it it's doesn't you don't tap your toes to it i was confusing it with the columbia the gem of the ocean which is the song that would always play during the Popeye cartoon. <laughs> but no, it's different, and it's kind of dull, to be, be perfectly honest. Although it's an okay song. Um, a number of other contenders, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, now, one of the interesting things is that it was popular almost immediately, and people did sometimes consider it the national anthem. And the custom, though, of standing was a thing that evolved very slowly. People would start standing at certain concerts. There was one in particular where somebody stood. It might have been during God Save the King, uh, and uh, the Americans copied him. I'm not sure. I don't recall. But anyway, that was um, very slow to come about, and people started removing their hats and so on, and then the military decided they had to salute. But they had all these questions like, should we keep our hats on? because that's the way we salute, or should we take them off like civilians do? And there was all these man hours wasted trying to ha craft a specific code of behavior during the Star Spangled Banner, which is pretty hilarious. And so there were a lot of complaints about the song. A lot of people hated it. First of all, it's hard to sing. An octave and a half, not easy for a non-professional. Uh, there are warlike words, and which are kind of hard to remember, too, because they're very poetic. The melody came from a degenerate drinking song. And at the time, there were all these temperance activists who wanted to outlaw alcohol. And so they hated it. The melody was by a Brit who was our enemy. Later on, people pointed out that the third verse, which nobody remembers nowadays, was anti-British. So when the British were our allies, they didn't want to sing the third verse. And, and now, there were a few that condemned it because Key owned slaves. Yes. He was an attorney, but he did have slaves, probably personal servants. I don't know if he had a hobby farm. I didn't research it enough. But anyway, you know, it was accepted at the time. And now, of course, since we've changed our minds, we have to condemn everybody who went along with, you know, something that was accepted by society. He had kind of a complicated uh, relationship with slavery. He defended the institution, but at the same time, he did free some of his slaves. And not all of them, though. And he did sometimes defend freed slaves, freedmen, in court as he was an attorney. So complicated, definitely complicated. And so the racism charges come up lately is because of that same third verse that nobody knows. Well, you don't have to sing it, to be honest, you know. But uh, this is what the words are. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. Now, what does that mean? Well, a lot of these radicals these days will say, oh, it's because cause they hated them, because they're black. Well, not exactly. The British 
hired mercenaries, which are the hireling, and they also entice slaves to flee and join the British army, which would be their ticket to freedom. You can't blame them for doing it, but at the same time, this made them the enemy. So uh, it's very appropriate to shoot back at them when they're shooting at you. That's what he meant. That's all he meant. So I agree with, with Ferris that it's not racist. Uh, now, it's, it's interesting to note that Southerners liked the melody so much that the Confederacy tried to claim the anthem as their own as well. It's kind of hard to do that when somebody's already got it. And even later on, it became a contentious thing. You know, there were all these rules, and there were two different kinds of patriots, according to Ferris. Liberal patriots, and I think he's one of those, as am I, and militant patriots, which are the kind that get really upset if you do something wrong. You know, you have to do something exactly the right way that they say so. If you don't you know, maybe you stand, but you don't put your hand against your heart. Maybe you have a religious objection. Well, heck with you. You should be thrown in the clink. <laughs> anyway, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but people do get upset about it, as we've seen with this recent protest with people kneeling and so on. And so, in fact, Ferris refers to the idea of flag worship, which means the people who took things perhaps a little too seriously. And indeed, you know, in my earlier days when I was more religious, I kind of thought, you know, maybe this is a little idolatrous. You know, maybe the Quakers are right about this kind of thing. Who knows? But you can still like the song. You don't have to take it to an extreme. So there were laws about it, though. There were laws written about the anthem, even though it wasn't official. <laughs> and they were never really enforced. Um, the laws against profaning the anthem... And the main thing they hated is using it commercially. And indeed, it was also illegal to use the flag in an advertisement. And that was the big thing, because people would never actually burn the flag. No, they would, you know, misuse it for their crass purposes. And they also banned interpreting it as gospel or jazz or ragtime, uh, playing excerpts without playing the whole verse. And playing it as part of a medley was also banned, you know, even if it was like with other patriotic songs like Hail Columbia, My Country Tis of Thee, etc. You weren't supposed to do that. Um, but, you know, eventually people had to disobey that rule. And along came a, a Puerto Rican man, and Puerto Rico was and is part of the United States. So this man is an American citizen, Jose Feliciano, 1968 World Series. And he is a very famous singer. He's rather elderly now, but a, a, a fantastic musician. And in this World Series at Tiger Stadium, he sang the anthem uh, to his guitar with a kind of slowed down Latin beat. And people were outraged. If you listen to this, and definitely check it out on YouTube, it the applause is rather subdued. I love this version. This is the most heartfelt version I've ever heard in my life. And if you don't choke up as an American, you're not an American when you hear this, when you hear this song, when you hear this version of the song. Uh, so he started the ball rolling and then, 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 you know, Jimi Hendrix came along at Woodstock and played the electric guitar version, which I like too. I think it's awesome. And so even though a lot of people say he, they, he was profaning the anthem, I say, no, he wasn't. And so the use of it in protest, you know, the use of it as a protest dates way back. A lot of people refused to stand or to sing because they were pacifists and they didn't like the warlike words, or because they just were so religious they didn't want to re recognize the state in any way. Occasionally, there were abolitionist types who objected because of Key and his history of slavery. Uh, some blacks, too. They said, this is not our anthem. But most famous blacks in the mid 20th century would say, yeah, this is for African Americans too, because we're Americans as well. Like Duke Ellington was one of those who celebrated it, uh, for example. Now, there is a so-called black national anthem called Lift Every Voice and Sing, and it's a great song. It's very moving, but I think we can only have one anthem. And, you know, play that, play that when it's appropriate, but it's not, it's not an alternative. You can, in my view, only have one. And I have no objection to taking the knee because freedom of speech. And indeed, people kneel in church, so kneeling isn't all that disrespectful, in my view. However, a lot, uh, even though I disagree with the anti-police sentiments that they're expressing, 
totally disagree with those. But at the same time, some of these radicals uh, would abridge our right of freedom of speech. Like the famous Colin Kaepernick, who started this kneeling thing, the football player, he talked Nike out of having the Betsy Ross flag on a running shoe, saying that, oh, it's racist. Well, heck with you, Colin. <laughs> I respected your right to free speech, but you don't respect mine, do you? <laughs> so, so it's been contentious from day one, and it's still contentious now. So I just want to talk a little bit more about the also rans, about the runners up. And for example, Hail Columbia, which was the other national anthem. Nobody was really sure which one was the official one. Basically, now it's considered the anthem of the vice president. So that's how unimportant we've made it. If you listen to it, the, the lyrics and melody are kind of forgettable. So I can see why compared to the soaring and uh, inspiring Star Spangled Banner, it kind of lost out. Second one, My Country Tis of Thee. My Country Tis of Thee. Lyrics written by Samuel Francis Smith in 1831. And this was to the tune of God Save the King. So that didn't work. We can't use another country's national anthem. <laughs> it's a great song, but sorry, already taken. And the actual tune, the actual uh, God Save the King is so old that nobody's sure who wrote it. And some say it came from an old Scottish carol, Remember, O Thou Man. I don't know how that fits the, the melody, but well, whatever. <laughs> Yet another one, God Bless America, written by Irving Berlin, an, an immigrant uh, from Russia uh, in 1918. And he wrote this wonderfully loved song, but he himself didn't want it to become the national anthem. He liked the Star Spangled Banner better. I guess he was a humble man, you know, even though he's very talented. Finally, America the Beautiful, which was written by Catherine Lee Bates. Its music was composed by a church organist and choir master, Samuel A. Ward. And they never knew each other. But she wrote this when she was inspired by a trip across the country, how beautiful the country is and how inspired she was to be an American in our ideals, etc. Uh, now, this was the, probably the most serious contender, contender. A lot of people who believed in uh, peace were in favor of this. And to be perfectly honest, I would vote for it over the banner. Sorry, I would. Um, and it's got a great melody, too. It's not like Hail Columbia. It's not forgive, forgettable. Just saying. Just saying. Nothing against the banner. I like this one better. Interesting fact about Bates. She never married. She had a longtime female companion that they lived together in what they called a Boston marriage. Allegedly platonic. These days, people assume she was probably a lesbian. Quite possible. Very, very possible. <laughs> but an interesting fact. You get a little diversity there for you. Another thing they had a lot of is they had a lot of anthem competitions because the Star Spangled Banner was not official. And a lot of people didn't like it, and you couldn't really use the British national anthem. And, and Hail Columbia was boring, so <laughs> they had all these competitions, and they were all failures. You know, nobody produced anything interesting. <clears throat> kind of a waste of time, <laughs> unfortunately, but I guess people probably had fun doing it. And so the, it had staying power for whatever reason. As much as people didn't like the fact it was hard to sing, you know, performers dread it because if they interpret it wrong, you know, people, they get condemned. If they flub the words, for example, Robert Goulet, he was a crooner, kind of like Frank Sinatra. He flubbed the words and his career took years to recover. And he said, give me a break. I'm Canadian. <laughs> I didn't grow up singing the words. But people didn't give him a break until finally they forgot. <laughs> and so it's it's definitely been a lot of controversy. Uh, but that's probably what makes it so interesting and so much fun. Finally, one little more tidbit, one additional tidbit. In God we trust on our money. That's from one of the other verses of the Star Spangled Banner, believe it or not. I never knew that. This has been my video on the history of the Star Spangled Banner, especially in review of this fascinating book by Mark Ferris, which I highly recommend to anybody who loves that kind of history. 
And so let me know what you think about this in the comments. Please like and subscribe. Please also check out my works on Amazon. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.